Hey there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. So today I want to be taking a look at the definition, the cloud. What is the cloud and what does it mean to me and you? So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, let's start with a mandatory joke about clouds. So here we got a bigger cloud says to a younger cloud, where do you want to work when you grow up? And the little one says, at Amazon. So before we get into more cloud stuff, this is a new series I'm starting called The Basics. And this is the first one, The Basics, What is the Cloud? And the idea is that I look at more simpler topics, defining you know different things that we come across in computing every day. And I thought I'd start with the cloud. Now, if you have any topics that you think I should cover, then please do let me know in the comments below and I'll see whether they will be good for this uh, basic series. And also for those of you that watch my channel frequently, you'll notice now that here I am in a little box. Uh, I'm recording this with a webcam. Normally I would just do the uh, presentation, but I thought let's see what happens if I actually include myself on this. So also sometimes I will be looking down like this to look at what I've uh, written on the text and sometimes I'll look up to the camera. Tell me in the comments below whether you think it's a useful addition to have me here in my little box or whether you think it's too distracting. I'm uh, pleased to hear what you think about that. Okay, let's crack on with the talk about the cloud. Okay, so what is the cloud? The cloud refers to servers, so it's obviously computers, and they're somewhere on the internet, and we access these servers via the internet, so that can be from our desktop, our PC, from our laptop, from uh, a smartphone, from a tablet, uh, from a smart TV, from anything that connects to the internet, we can access the cloud. And the cloud offers services, everything from, let's say, uh, email or, or YouTube, as you're watching now, uh, through to things like computing power with CPUs, GPUs, even storage. And of course, in the cloud, there are physical servers, there are actual computers running with disks and memory and lots of cooling and they're in big server farms, but they are managed by the cloud provider. So that's not something that you as a person would manage, even if you're into IT or development, they'd be managed by the cloud provider. And because they're managed by the cloud provider, it's worth noting that there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between a service and a server. So in the old days, if you wanted to have a website, then you would maybe get a server and you would run that website and maybe the backend database and any other stuff that you needed to keep on there on that server. Once you get to this idea of something that's more virtualized, then the relationship between how many servers there are, how many disks there are, how many services are provided are completely abstracted away. And the service provider, the cloud provider, ensures there's enough hardware enough servers, enough memory, enough CPUs, enough hard disks, enough network capacity so that it can handle the peak uh, demands. And the services could be anywhere in the world according to the scheme set up by the service provider. They could be on a server. Maybe when you buy cloud servers, you can say, I want these to be on the East Coast of America or I want these to be in Germany, in uh, you know, in uh, Europe or something, or I want this to be down uh, in Japan. And as you can pick, but once you get to that level after that, which server it particularly on is, is none of your business. That's really the cloud provider who worries about all that stuff. There's a, a level of abstraction here where things are taken care of by the cloud provider. And there are different ways to look at how the services of the cloud are provided. And we're going to look at these in detail. Software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, function as a service. So they've all got this as, as a service kind of uh, part to them. And so let's just dive in and you'll see exactly what I mean by that. So software as a service is probably what you're most used to as a consumer uh, in the fact that uh, what happens is, is that uh, someone provides a service, whether that's Gmail, for example, YouTube, as I said, for watching this video, and all you do is you access that service. You don't care about YouTube's servers. You don't care about whether it's an AMD server or an Intel server or whether it's got eight gigabytes of memory or 64 gigabytes of memory. You don't care how many hard disks it's got attached to it. You just want to watch your YouTube video. So they are, so Google actually buys from itself its own service for running uh, this thing. Now, if you wanted to build your own uh, service, whether that's, you know, video, email, multimedia, blogging, vlogging, you know, uh, online office suites, you know, whatever you want to do, you can buy software as a service and say, uh, I would like to have access to that thing, please. So Google Apps 
gives you access to Gmail and obviously all that kind of stuff. Slack, very popular. Office 365, you can get access to Excel and PowerPoint and all that uh, online as a service, Dropbox, and of course, iCloud with the word cloud in it from Apple for the email and for the story. So you can buy, uh, you can get hold of sometimes free like Gmail, sometimes you pay for it if it's a business version of Google Apps. Uh, you get hold of these services and you don't care about how they're providing the service. You just want the service. Give me email, give me YouTube, make it reliable. I don't care how you do it. Now, at this point, I just want to mention that uh, if you are interested in learning about cloud computing, I noticed this deal here, the pay what you want, learn to code deal. But what's interesting down here at the bottom is learn cloud computing with, uh, with Amazon, AWS. And you can pay whatever you want. So if you pay just $1 for that one, you're going to get that one. You also get the course about Git. So those are two pretty good uh, things to learn about for just $1. If you pay more than the average at the moment is just under $20. And you also get all this other stuff about Python and HTML and how to be a certified web developer and some Linux stuff, PHP, SQL. So some good stuff in there for only $20. Now, if you do buy through this link, you help out this channel. Okay, let's carry on and look about uh, more about cloud. So after software as a service, you get platform as a service. Now this is more if you want to build your own application and then the service provider, the cloud provider will give you obviously an operating system somewhere with storage and memory and networking, but it'll also give you all the development tools that would mean a web server and you know whatever middleware you're gonna use, Java, PHP, JavaScript, you know, whatever backend stuff, databases you need. Uh, it provides the complete web application life cycle, that's building, testing, deploying, managing, and updating. So if you were launching your own service that's different to Google's uh, apps or different to Slack, different to YouTube, but you've got this new thing you want to do, but you say, well, actually, but I just want somewhere to put it. And I want you to worry about all of the other stuff. Then this is uh, what you need, platform as a service. And some examples of that would be uh, Amazon's Elastic Beanstalk, uh, Microsoft's Azure and uh, OpenShift. And there are, of course, uh, others. So platform, the platform to host your application provides you as a service. They worry about all the other stuff. And then if you go lower down even still, you can get infrastructure as a service. So you're more talking about servers and storage and they give you everything that you need. But of course, those servers will be virtualized. Remember, there won't be a relationship between a server and data storage and your thing. You will say, I want this amount of power. And they'll say, okay, you can have a slice of this server or you can have you know, many, many servers and we'll just make sure it all kind of fits together. Uh, and use buying the infrastructure. So the, the nuts and the bolts, the cables and the wires and the plugs, they handle all of that. You just know that you can log in, you can copy it over files, you can do what you need, you can compile, you can deploy, you can manage, you can debug, you can do everything you need all over this stuff. So Amazon Web Services, DigitalOcean, Google's Compute Engine, OpenStack, many, many examples of infrastructure. So the infrastructure that's provided to you as a service over the internet. And then if we look at this triangle here, you can see that at the top, software as a service, you don't care about what's going on down here in the bottom, all this big stuff. You just care about the service. And then the further down this kind of stack you go, the more you are exposed to different things. So platform as a service, you are exposed to a lot more than if you're just having somewhere to, uh, you know, just using Gmail or, or YouTube, whatever. Here you're dealing with actually all oh, what's going on behind. And then even further down infrastructure, you're dealing with much more, how much disk space do you want? How much computing space do you want? How much? And you just, it, the more, the further down you go, the more low level it is and the more details you need to know about what's going on. Now, there is another type which has come kind of popular over the last recent years, which is function as a service, sometimes known as serverless computing. And that breaks down the cloud uh, even smaller than just a server or the infrastructure, you can actually say, well, I want this much computing power, or I need this much storage, or I need this many database, or I need to do this kind of many millions of messages a second. And you're breaking it down, not just to, you know, a, a box of, which would be a hard disk and a memory, and a, you know, a, a server, but you're actually saying, I want something that you can, a server provides, but I want to say how much I want. So I want this much computing power. I want this much storage. Uh, and then the cloud provider handles the configuration of that, how it handles that, the provisioning of it, the load balancing, the scaling. Suddenly you want more computing power. You want more storage. You want more messages sent every hour. And then it can just scale that up for you. So you're looking at the functionality. I want, I've got a very 
data base intensive application doesn't need much computing but it sends lots of messages well then you need this oh i've got something that churns out you know lots and lots of scientific data it works really really hard and it only needs a very very small amount of storage because it's doing all the you know you can pick and choose what you want in terms of actually the components of a server so that's function as a service sometimes known as serverless computing so what would be the advantage and the disadvantages of the cloud? Well, think about if you are using you know, Gmail or something, if you were trying to handle your own G email, you would need to run your own server. You would need to worry about how email flows. I mean, how does email flow? I, mean, I actually know that, but maybe you don't. You know, what are all the things that need to happen? So you reduce costs. If you're a business, again, you reduce costs because you're not having to handle all of that stuff. But of course you do pay for this. You, none of this is free, you pay for it. And you have to do a calculation on, is it cheaper to buy it as a service or is it cheaper to uh, have my own and you know in my own building within my own machine room with cooling and fire prevention and you know there's a whole bunch of stuff networking and all that stuff and stable electricity supplies and all this kind of stuff and of course it's scalable you might uh, buy your server and do it all yourself and then suddenly actually our, our business has got really popular I need more you know so you it can scale because it's the cloud they would hopefully you can find out about you know what can I have my data in two places one in America, one in Europe, and then if there's a disaster, of course we wouldn't want that to happen, but if there was, you know, even a tornado or, or a hurricane or something, maybe knock something out, the business can continue because the server is also, and you as a business probably don't have, you know, a server room in America and a server room in, in Europe. And then of course, things like software updates are all handled by the service provider. So security updates particularly. And so security is in the cloud provider's hand, which is an advantage if you're not a security expert. Uh, if you don't know what you need to uh, to do to keep those servers uh, up to date. But of course, the downside, and this applies to things like uh, email and YouTube and then all the way through to running your own business, is that it's actually they're not yours. There is a sense of renting of a service agreement, but nothing's actually yours. It's someone else's server. Now, some people don't like that term, but I'm talking about in the levels of actually I don't own it. I'm living in this kind of rentable world, in this kind of service based world uh, where I, I, it's not mine. And so, of course, you need to be able to trust your cloud provider. You know, they're not going to go bankrupt. They do offer the right stuff. They do have the right kind of capacity, you know, blah, 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 to make sure that if you're going to build your business or even just your consumer services, like I upload to YouTube, you're watching this video on YouTube, I don't say, oh, uh, do Google have enough computing power to cope with my video? What happens if people can't watch my video? I don't need to worry about that because in that sense, I'm able to trust uh, Google. Of course, also you're uploading your intellectual property off site. So if you are developing the latest new whatever gizmo, and then you've let it out of your building, it, it's gone. Now you wouldn't probably let your employees or, or whatever, you know, kind of print out the designs and put them in their bag and go home with them, but now you're actually sending all this information off site. So what are the, uh, you know, what are the, the, the things here? And that also comes back to securities in the cloud provider's hand, which I said it was a, was a pro, but also it means that you've got to trust them because if there is a security breach and we are reading every day about security breaches, there've been some big ones recently as well, then actually that security breach, uh, and of course the whole Twitter thing recently we had, you know, these security breaches are in their hands. And of course you might say, well, I've just handed over the keys to my business or the keys to my emails and my and my YouTube videos and my blogs and my photos and my, you know, whatever it, wherever, whatever level you're at, whether you're a consumer or whether you're a business, I've handed them all over to the other people and then it got hacked and they all got stolen. Uh, so, you know, security is in their hands and you've got to be able to consider, can you trust them? Okay, so kind of the kind of wrap up here, I've called it permutations and combinations because there are different levels of cloud computing and the lines sometimes can become blurred. Maybe software as a service is pretty obvious. Gmail, YouTube, as I've been saying, Microsoft 365. But once you get down further down the line, then things, because it's much more low level, different companies maybe express things in different ways. Containers will also be part of it, not just virtualization, but containers. And of course, cloud computing isn't static like a real cloud. It's kind of, it's growing, it's moving, it's kind of developing, new things are happening. If you think about machine learning recently, that's been added. So you now have services where you can upload, let's say a thousand pictures, and you want to be able to detect the difference between, you know, 
you know, anything, you know, medicine between a virus and something, a bacteria and something, or, or parts in your business, or, or a hot dog or whatever, you know, you can pick those uh, and you can teach the machine, but you don't need to do it on your machine. It all gets happened and then the neural network is kind of all the numbers you need are given to you and all that crunching work that happened, you just said, oh, okay, do the machine learning, please. So this kind of thing is growing, expanding all the time and we may see more and more different things offered in the cloud at those different levels, depending what it is that you're trying to achieve. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. As I said, this is the beginning of the basic series. If you have any topics you'd like me to cover, please do tell me in the comments below what you think of me in my box. Did that help the presentation? Did that help at all? Please, again, let me know in the comments below. And if you like these kind of videos, well, why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.